We'll have three speakers, so we're going to do 20 minutes piece and then Q&A all at the end. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Just a quick overview of the session. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, in various different ways, shapes, and forms, the opportunities and challenges of deploying um, and building and offering mobile, uh, advanced mobile services for MSOs, um, covering the range of spectrum uh, utilization and, and uh, things like CBRS and other propagation properties, as well as what the device ecosystem is doing uh, and supporting and things like dual SIM, uh, dual standby, and dynamic dual SIM, dual standby. And then um, also just the general challenges of architecting and building reusable uh, network components as an MSO that uh, can be used for various different wireless strategies. Uh, so I will um, kick off. We're going to have uh, Drew Davis start us off from Cox. Uh, Drew is the Executive Director of Wi-Fi Technology at Cox. Uh, he's got over 25 years of telecom engineering, engineering experience with focus on wireless design and strategy, including uh, large-scale build-outs of cell networks, DAS systems, and Wi-Fi networks. And um, <clears throat> he's currently responsible for the development of existing Wi-Fi services platform at Cox and uh, additional wireless technology deployment, including core and etc. All right, go ahead and kick off. So yeah, I'm Drew Davis, uh, new to the cell, uh, cable industry, so this will be my, I'm in my third year at Cox, um, previous to that, long time in wireless industry. Um, the fun thing about being wireless technology at Cox is, you know, something, I, I get the broad breadth of, of everything we're working on or looking at in wireless, whether it's IoT or 5G, Wi-Fi, and, you know, 5G, there's, there's two of us spending maybe 10% of our time looking at it. At, you know, my last company, AT&T, there's probably 40 guys that were in wireless technology looking at it before they ever got close to it. So you definitely get a broad view of what's going on, probably broader than what I even had in consulting in the wireless industry. Um, when you look at the, what's coming at us, I, I think 5G, is, is kind of a broad kind of banner for a lot of specific issues and it, it, it covers a lot of ground. There's a lot of hype involved right now, but there is still a lot of concern. Um, we're seeing meaningful, you know, wireless substitution with LTE service. So the questions when you start hearing that 5G may be 100 times faster than 4G, you know, what is that gonna do for wireless substitution for MSOs? I think when you look at you know your 5G home broadband, you know Verizon's done a trial. They've demonstrated these speeds of 300 megabits. So from a technology, it's real. I, I think as a business case, it, it still struggles. I think when we look at it on the the opportunity side of where would we use that, you know, at in our toolbox, I think we find is you know it wouldn't ever be for business case for us makes sense where we already have cable or fiber. It's, it's just cable is going to be a superior customer experience as, and a superior, you know, network value from our point of view than, than tr us trying to implement. Now where that might not be true is in rural areas where we've not deployed any network. Maybe this opens up the door to new areas. Um, so we're definitely looking at that. NFL venues, they that, that's a meaningful, I think, and where I'm probably most bullish on the 5G business case that when you get into a venue and you're enabling, you know, people to get a more meaningful experience looking at the field or something like that. And it, but that to me is more, that's not, you know, going to be broadband substitution for us. That's more maybe impacting our Wi-Fi deployments at the venue. That's a competition. Um, enterprises, you know, 5G, I, I think you could put LTE, you know, 
advanced in for any of these, and it's, it's what we face in the market today. I don't think there's really new threats there from, from the enterprise standpoint and from the public sector. I, I think we have the same problems with smart city and public safety. It's, it's really a funding issue. The city's interested. We're engaged with a lot of cities, but we're not seeing you know, tons of real um, business case from the city side to deploy things. But we are working and trying to help them. Um, on the positive side, you know, again, in addition to smart city, um, we in the consumer wireless MVNO, we continue to look at that space. That really changes the dynamics of, of what you would invest and do in wireless when you have a MVNO business where you need to offload. You're already committed to paying network costs. So if you're in that business, and Cox is not today, although we continue to evaluate it. Um, so that's, I would say, you know, the business case for offload is, is a very positive one. So if you're already in there and you defer costs instead of paying it to Verizon or AT&T, you're going to invest in your own network. I, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I talked about fixed wireless in rural. That is something I think, you know, it may not be a large revenue solution, but it could be a meaningful from uh, the brand around cable of serving broadband to rural areas. So I, I think it's something we're strongly looking at. And then I, IoT in the home, there, there's a wide range of IoT. We, we have our home life, there's smart home out there. there we're certainly, today, our, it's a traditional mix of Wi-Fi, Zigbee, uh, Bluetooth. Um, I think finding a way to use LoRa or some other IoT, that, that's certainly part of this. Uh, when we look at business verticals, I, private LTE, and we, we have a very strong presence in hospitality area with Wi-Fi, so managed Wi-Fi services. We, we probably serve you know, everything from Caesars in Vegas and Las Vegas Convention Center down to Motel 6s and with a wide range of kind of capabilities and products. And I, I think adding on security applications around private LTE into these spaces and you know, door access control and things like that. I, there's some really strong use cases in hospitality that I think we need to attack. I think CBRS is going to enable that and we're looking you know, very closely at that. Um, and VRAN hosting is a, it's a wonderful business model. I'm not sure the carriers are as excited about paying us money to offload their networks onto ours, but I think hotels would be excited to pay us to build those networks if we could even just get non-revenue roaming into their hotels, they, they would love to improve the LTE experience in their hotels. So. so we're looking at a lot of stuff. So if, if we're on this, you know, we're here at Cox. We're right in the ideation and proof of concept. We have not made any big commitments, whether it's MVNO or CBRS. Um, so a lot of how this deck came together is, is trying to talk about how do we when you're looking at a lot of things and you've got a small team and a small budget, how do you, how do you look efficiently and enable? So, so a lot of what needs to happen is we need to look at across all these things. We need to, one, validate the use cases that they're real and that they work and product understands what they are before, and, and then move out to you know, doing trials and operationalizing them so that they can you know, get out and either fail quickly or succeed. But we, we don't have time to ramp up big, you know, separate architecture and network teams around every opportunity. Um, the other challenge with what we're looking at is there's a wide range of what we talk about um, network. 5G is not just one network. 5G is, you know, whether you call it network slicing, it's really, it's a very flexible network architecture that you can attack a bunch of different use cases, everything from low latency to very high density. Um, and the way you would deploy for specific use cases, you may be strong edge components with some of this and strong core components with other. So it's not just a, a single architecture, but what we, we're trying to do is what are the common elements that get us started that allowed us to move forward kind of in a measured way. And again, the business challenges, you know, we can be successful. I think the, the, 
the flip side of all the negative is, is we haven't made huge investments in wireless networks. We're starting from scratch. We, we don't have to be bound by legacy networks we have out there or backwards compatibility. Um, the other things we have going on is, and I think this is true across the MSO space, we have lots of internal programs around convergence, virtualization, automation that we can leverage. The, the key to leveraging those and getting to a, an ideal state is knowing kind of what your target architecture is. So, so we spend some time trying to say, okay, we're not going to get there tomorrow. It's not a 2020 plan, but what, what is our you know, five-year, ten-year plan of where we're heading. So as these other work streams in the business are moving, we can identify, we can kind of point them at where we're headed, um, you know, when we're choosing to automate or virtualize something. That's the opportunity to, to look at the reference architecture. And so we came up with, with kind of what is, you know, from a, a logical kind of basis, what, what's in the architecture. And we look at the components here in the and this, this area is the, what we would call the converged core. So these are the elements. A lot of them we have today. They may not be virtualized, uh, but they support our wireline networks. They would also support our, our wireless networks. Um, this would be kind of the mobility core overlay that we would need to get into wireless in a, in a meaningful way. This would kind of serve kind of all areas. This is, again, where we would start. And the other part of this is looking at the edge side of what, what's on the edge that would be shared network. And when we say edge cloud, we're really talking at the region or market level, um, not a national data center is when we talk about the data center cloud over here. Um, and the same on mobility. And then we have, at the far right, we have our kind of RAN, you know, wireless networks components, which are, you know, either our RAN, uh, a shared RAN or our Wi-Fi networks. And then on the left, we also have to connect to our partners. Um, so this, I think, is a great um, document for, as a reference, it's, again, we probably never built this exactly, but it, it, get, it informs and helps our decisions as, as we're trying to take initial steps. So if we look, you know, what a foundational architecture, so what, to get to this from that last one, we ran, you know, 10, 15 use cases and actually looked at what elements of the core and the edge do we need for each use case and then kind of landed on, well, pretty much all of them require, oh, I'm back up now. There we go. So all of them are going to require basically, this is Drew's funding request for an EPC, right? Like, so that's all this is. But basically says you're not going to do much in wireless without these core elements. And it's a pretty safe bet if you believe we're moving forward with anything in wireless. You don't have to tell me what you're doing exactly, product or strategy. But anything you're going to do, these are, this is probably not a regrettable spin that we can get started. This is going to help us test. And the way you can see, then you would layer on, if we looked at M MVNO next, you would layer on some more core. Again, we're not at this point building any RAN activity. We're not putting anything at the edge. This would be something that would enable us to work with an MVNO partner. But, but it's more full MVNO. It's more like what Altice is doing with Sprint, not, not just a provisioning. Um, but that would allow us more kind of core control over the, the service levels of our customers. If you jump to, to fixed wireless, again, on CBRS, it, it looks a lot like an MVNO, but now we've, we're putting out um, our own RAN components. So for fixed wireless, that may be very limited to some targeted point-to-point -point dishes for enterprise customers, or it may be point-to-multi-point -point for uh, um, residential customers. The, the thing here is, is I think this probably stays in the core, but you know we at this point can start playing and uh, looking at when do you move some virtual EPC components to the edge, um, depending on what latency you need and what kind of service levels you want to maintain. And then private LT is another kind of tout that because that's a, I think that's a significant use case. Again, it looks a lot like fixed wireless. You definitely at this point are definitely moving your virtual EPC, at least to the market, maybe to the premise, depending on what 
the private LTE requirements are. Um, we're integrating now our, our RAN and a seamless service with enterprise Wi-Fi. So there may be, you know, not just LTE or 5G RAN components, but we'll also have a seamless enterprise Wi-Fi um, component. You could, you know, quickly add on here other IoT. Um, it gets a little more complicated to do LoRa handoffs or anything like that, but you, it's starting to look, you know, on a 5G core with, with slices that you start to not care about that kind of stuff um, as much. And then it's part of, you know, it's just kind of basic that, you know, if, if you look at trying to put together your case, you know, of, of proving in the whole build out, the, the core is a small piece, especially, you know, if you virtualize it, there's, there's several vendors out there with, with very kind of new entries, but very low cost virtual EPCs. Um, that allow you to get in and trial and test things. Um, and then you could see as you actually roll out um, products, your biggest investments are coming when you, you get to the RAN. Um, that, that's going to be where your big investments come from. But from a, you know, if you're in this interim time where you're trialing and, and trying to prove things in, I, the case here is that you can, for you know, a subset of what the full business case costs, you, you can get into um, fully starting to operationalize wireless in your network and looking at how you support things as they roll out. And that's it. I think we're going to hold questions in. Yeah, hold okay. questions in. Yeah. Awesome. All right, thanks, Drew. That's great. Some really good stuff there. Um, I think uh, we're going to hold the questions for everybody until the end so we can do them all in one. One big swoop. Um, the next speaker is uh, Lloyd Cresham. He uh, is on the wireless device engineering team at Charter with myself. And he's going to be talking about uh, dual SIM uh, as a device ecosystem, what's happening in dual SIM and how that's uh, helping to enable some of these new use cases for mobile deployments uh, for <coughs> MSOs. Um, Loy is, uh, <coughs> let's see. He's got uh, over 20 years building networks, Wi-Fi networks, and uh, public outdoor in-flight networks and hospitality. Um, he's been part of the TWC team that first deployed uh, Passpoint in the U.S. And um, like I said, he's currently working with us at the, in Charter on the device engineering team and heading up the architecture for our connectivity uh, optimization platforms, connectivity management platforms, and uh, device engineering. And go ahead and let you. Today about uh, DSDS and uh, high level and why we're using it, um, um, and uh, um, okay. so we'll uh, start by the. You, we know that MSOs uh, started offering services <laughs> as mobile services, with, uh, wireless mobile services, in the form of uh, MVNO. And uh, after they start uh, offering that, uh, they looked into ways to minimize the cost and to improve user experience. Um, one of the main ways uh, that uh, was clear is that uh, to offload the data into their own network. And uh, to do that, they require a handset or uh, user equipment to uh, connect to both network. One network that is for the uh, MNO and the other network that is uh, owned and operated by the MSO. Um, so utilizing, uh, looking at the, those devices in the market, 
we know that there is a, a dual SIM devices used in the market overseas. Uh, and uh, those devices utilize dual credentials to connect to both networks. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, and those devices, the DSDS, uh, they're called uh, dual SIM, dual standby, where the dual SIM are accessible in a uh, time multiplexing, and they're used uh, uh, to, sub to provide the link at any given time. So, in the, um, the, the existing handset, the existing DSDS that's available in the market, uh, they have uh, different uh, uh, assumption when they build those handsets. One of the main assumptions is that both networks uh, really uh, over cover uh, and, and provide coverage, the same coverage as they are. So it's not like a small cell and a, a wide coverage, but <coughs> the coverage overlap for both uh, SIM networks. So that's one of the uh, uh, assumption. And uh, in this, we uh, found out that the existing DSDS on the shelf does not meet our requirement for the offload. The other thing, if you uh, had the chance to work with a, a DSDS device, that it requires a subscriber or the user to uh, set which network is used for data and which network is used for voice. So there's a toggle switch and that's uh, devices, uh, if you've seen them before. Uh, that will fix the network into which SIM to use for data and which SIM to use for voice. Uh, which doesn't meet uh, also the requirement. Uh, also in, uh, uh, also in those uh, DSDS devices, because the, the coverage overlap, uh, there was nothing built inside the device for session continuity. So when you set the uh, data for one network, you anticipate the device will use that network uh, for data, and uh, the coverage for that network uh, has to be available for it to use data. Where in MSOs, it might be a small cell, it might be a CBRS, we need to go in and out of that uh, uh, coverage area. So um, mobile engineering at uh, Charter Communication, uh, we propose a, a dynamic DSDS solution. Uh, the UE uh, has to have some intelligence to know which network to use for data. Uh, keep in mind that we're trying here to offload data and not voice. At this stage, there is no benefit in offloading voice but we concentrate most on data. So we wanted to get the user uh, intervention out from the equation and we want the handset itself to dynamically switch uh, between networks for data. Uh, in, in that way, we, we know that we wanted to build that uh, intelligence in the handset, so we added in addition to the uh, thresholds that are already configured on the handset to select a network. Uh, we added to that like uh, awareness of coverage area through geofencing and also we added to, uh, as a, a multiple profiles, we included multiple profiles so the handset can, based on the location, select which profile, which network to offload and also uh, we included uh, link aggregation uh, where we can um, minimize session interruption and uh, preserve uh, session continuity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, 
network rule that we built into that uh, device. So in, in that case, uh, we are gonna have the device uh, always latch to the MNO for voice services. All the voice services are gonna be attached to the MNO. And we're gonna use the uh, MSO for offloading data. So if you are within, if the device is within coverage of the MSO uh, network, it will use the MSO for data. And if it is out of that coverage, then it can uh, intelligently switch back to the MNO data. In the case where we have uh, voice calls, uh, keep in mind it's time multiplexing, so it will uh, shift all the data stream back to the MNO where the voice call is uh, active. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the data plane here. In the um, setup for the UE, the both uh, uh, PDNs are going to be registers, packet data networks, and the UE will be registered with both networks, the MNO and the MSO. Uh, but at any given time, there's only one active and one in standby. So in the case of data, when we are within coverage of the uh, MSO uh, network, the, uh, M the, M the PDN for the MSO is gonna be the active one. When we are uh, in the MNO network and there's no coverage for MSO, then the PDN for the uh, MNO network is gonna be active and the PDN for MSO is standby. In the case of, uh, of course, because we're gonna keep uh, the voice all connected to the MNO, the handset has to tune away and listen for uh, paging intervals on the MNO network at that time. Um, uh, in the case of uh, also uh, having a voice call, the PDN for the uh, MNO is gonna be the active PDN during that voice service. Um, I'm gonna talk about also geofencing, what we're uh, suggesting in <coughs> geofencing. Um, we're gonna give a capability to the UE to be aware of uh, coverage, uh, of air coverage for small cell for MSO network. And this will help us with the uh, trigger uh, scanning when the UE is within the coverage area. So the UE will start scanning and start the process for latching to the um, MSO network. And also at the same time will uh, start the process of detaching from the MSO network uh, when we try when we move when the device is moving outside uh, the MSO uh, coverage. Uh, the one additional benefit is that to res reserve resources. So let's assume that uh, the we are in a location or the UE is in a location that doesn't have. Uh, coverage of our MSO network, we don't want the UE to keep on uh, scanning continuously, trying to find the network for that SIM. So at that uh, stage, the geofencing will kick in and it will halt that process until the UE is within coverage of the MSO network. Also, what we're uh, adding capability is that the link aggregation. Uh, some of you heard of uh, TCP multipath or quick or, but what we're doing is something uh, over the top because we wanted to have more control uh, on that. And uh, the goal for having uh, link aggregation is to guarantee session continuity. So in link aggregation in our implementation, we will have uh, an app that will provide uh, a tunnel 
back to an aggregation server and also provide a virtual IP address uh, to the device. Um, in this case, all applications running on the device or user application running on the device will only have visibility to that web. They will not use the interface IP address, whether it was uh, uh, LTE uh, 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 macro cell or LTE small cell CBRS or Wi-Fi. So and the apps on the device will have visibility only to that uh, VIP that's assigned to the device. And uh, here I'm describing how the tunnel and the aggregation server work. So <coughs> if you have uh, uh, LTE CBRS or uh, LTE macro and Wi-Fi, they will all uh, appear to the application server uh, as one IP address, one source for that uh, uh, device. So let's assume application server over there is like a, um, a YouTube or any application server. Uh, the device uh, app running on top will see one IP for the device, which is a virtual IP, that's a source IP, and the destination will be the application. Same thing from the application side. They will see only one IP for the device. And this way we'll, we can switch between networks and uh, the app will not notice the interruption because it's using the virtual IP. And this is one of the results from our testing our field testing with a dynamic DSDS. So um, and in this uh, case, I want to describe the stationary. So stationary, it's uh, either MNO network or MSO network. So we're not doing having mobility, but we took uh, readings on the MSO network and on the MNO network. And we saw those uh, uh, type of applications uh, behaving uh, excellent. Uh, then at low mobility, this is low speed mobility, what we mean with that. Uh, we saw some uh, changes in the streaming and uh, video calls. So, and we, I wanted to emphasize on the streaming, we took multiple type of apps, so depending on uh, the buffering on that app, we got different results. So if the buffering is uh, large, then you will notice it. But if the buffering is small, then you will notice that transition. But it was uh, mostly uh, uh, good uh, uh, user experience when we did the, the test. And high mobility, you can see high mobility, high speed mobility between networks. And we saw... Uh, um, an effect on most of the apps, but we, uh, uh, it's not like intrusive. It, so it wasn't like interruption. Uh, we saw that the, in the uh, streaming and video call, the user did notice that transition between network, but on the others, uh, it was working in a, a good manner. And there's no, inter the user was not able to uh, distinguish that he's in transition. It was working really good. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Louis. Great stuff. I think uh, the results from what we've seen so far on that dual SIM on the device side is pretty promising as to where we think the user experience can be in the end. We'll talk more uh, during the Q&A. Um, so the, the last presenter we have is uh, Hani Bashara from Ericsson. He's the director of network products at Ericsson. Um, and he's responsible for the market development solutions for radio access network and IoT for tier one operators today. Uh, he's got 20 years of experience doing R&D, product management, technical sales, marketing, 
the whole smorgasbord in a sense. <laughs> so, um, he's going to talk about uh, spectrum uh, propagation properties and just uh, the, the different pieces of spectrum that uh, are in the arsenal and toolbox that uh, MSOs can use to deploy wireless networks today. So, okay. right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to be here, actually. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. So the, uh, I guess I want to talk about how do we introduce uh, 5G as, uh, in, into a heterogeneous network and how can we optimize that process for introducing 5G to uh, take best advantage of your spectrum if there is an existing, existing spectrum and also um, of your existing uh, network equipment if it exists. Uh, so it would be a, an easy transition as we uh, introduce 5G into a network, for instance. Right, so uh, as we look into uh, uh, 5G and the spectrum needed in, in, in any heterogeneous network, um, you have a number of requirements to meet. First, you have, you want to achieve coverage. And coverage from a spectrum perspective uh, is something you want to, you can achieve best when you start using the low spectrum uh, that would be available. So low bands, mid bands help you from providing the uh, wide coverage that you would need for a network. Uh, however, if you start looking into capacity, for instance, that's a different requirement. And to achieve best capacity, uh, 5G, for instance, would come here into play. It can, uh, can achieve extremely high throughput and very high capacity with millimeter wave. So you have a, a number of assets. And when you start looking to spectrum, uh, you have to manage the, all the requirements uh, from low bands to high bands, and you basically from coverage to bandwidth to latency. Uh, latency is another interesting requirement. Uh, latency is pretty small when you start looking to 5G and millimeter wave, which have a, a subcarrier spacing uh, that allows almost one eighth of a millisecond latency. Uh, however, when we start getting down into the millimeter, uh, sorry, from the millimeter wave into the low bands, uh, a, the, the latency for a regular LTE networks is usually, for LTE is 10 millisecond, we can improve on that a lot in, in, uh, in 5G. So what you really have here is, is spectrum trade-off, uh, where as you look into a heterogeneous network with 4G and 5G, you start using uh, all the available spectrum for you to achieve uh, your coverage, bandwidth, and latency requirements, and you have to trade off all those requirements and use the use cases, uh, look into where the use case would work best. Um, from perspective of devices, if you, when we start looking to 4G and 5G, um, the Ericsson Mobility Report, uh, a very well respected uh, forecast uh, for, for how the mobile devices and penetration in general um, you know, are forecasted, and usually Ericsson releases this every uh, six months. Um, you look into 2G, 3G devices, 2G devices, uh, uh, now many networks have actually been decommissioned already and the spectrum has been uh, already allocated to uh, 4G. But you can see the purple, the WCDMA HSPA is really starting to diminish. It, it's uh, probably in the, uh, you know, small numbers already. And, and you can probably feel that we're all consumers. And you, you see how very small numbers. Uh, CDMA, the gray, is almost non-existent. I think uh, there are very few uh, CDMA networks. And I think between Sprint has still some uh, remnants, I, I would say, of, of CDMA. And as well as, as Verizon, I think Verizon is, is shutting down the CDMA networks. End of this year, uh, Sprint probably, especially with uh, proposed mergers, probably not going to last too long. So CDMA is, is almost... Uh, are gone and, and but how you see 
Today, we really, it's, it's all 4G networks, vast, vast majority, 95 plus of the subscription <coughs> and mobile and, and devices. But you can see the trend uh, where 5G will have a very uh, fast ramp. Um, as you can see, all, all uh, almost uh, the four tier ones from uh, service operators are, are now introducing uh, 5G devices. Prices are slightly high. You can, uh, most of them have a pretty expensive $1,200, I think, uh, device. Uh, and given that the network coverage is not that great, I think right now it's probably a bit challenging. Other devices in the order of $700, $100 are actually coming in the very short term. And uh, also more uh, efficient chipsets that will enable even cheaper devices. So what we're seeing is actually, you can see here the, the ramp of the orange, which is 5G devices. We expect uh, over 60% of subscriptions to be on 5G by 2024. What this is really telling us is that if, we, if, if a, a service provider today introducing 5G, he's gonna have a very small number of devices in his network. And if he starts allocating a lot of spectrum with, and spectrum is the most valuable asset. If you start allocating that today into 5G, it's probably going to be very lightly used. Uh, the whole challenge and, and really what we want to talk about today is how can we introduce 5G while preserving spectrum to optimize it so, so there would be a, an easy transition and, and, and reuse of spectrum really between 4G and 5G using what we call uh, the dynamic spectrum sharing between 4G and 5G. And at the same time, take, taking into account uh, the user experience and maximizing that, whether it's on 4G with LTE or on 5G, um, to, to basically um, be able to, to uh, have the best possible introduction of 5G. And at the same time, as you can, uh, as you see today in the marketplace, there is really a um, race over who has the most coverage. So the idea is also to uh, have the most 5G coverage with the uh, most optimal, in the most optimal way without uh, introducing tons of hardware initially. Um, the ways to do it, there's multiple ways of doing it and, and, and just, you know, so statically, you can have, uh, you know, if, if the green is uh, LTE spectrum and blue is uh, basically the 5G spectrum, you can use, uh, you know, a slow transition in small increments of 5G as the number of devices, for instance, starts growing. So, uh, you know, you give a small portion to 5G and you can increase that uh, to statically, obviously, right, over a certain period of time. And not the most, uh, you know, optimal method, mainly because, again, anything that you do with static initially, devices, very few devices take advantage of any spectrum you give. So, so it's always challenged uh, providing any uh, you know, static method of, 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 from a spectrum perspective. However, there are a lot of other innovations to actually be able to do that in a, in a much better way. One of them, for, here is a couple of ideas, for instance, of how we introduce spectrum in a, in a more efficient way. Um, and and in innovations, for instance, um, if, if you are aware of what's happening with CBRS, the uh, uh, basically citizen broadband, citizen broadband radio service, which actually is a really good innovation here in the U.S., driven by the FCC and all the OEMs and service providers, where we're basically uh, able to use um, unlicensed spectrum that would be shared between uh, a number of uh, service providers or, for that matter, any private network. And the whole idea is really around having a database-driven dynamic spectrum sharing approach where there is a database that uh, basically has the information into what spectrum is available and in which counties, for instance, or which locations. And uh, you would have every access point request the spectrum. And if the spectrum is available, it would get the spectrum. If it's not available, it would actually wouldn't get the spectrum. So it becomes a, a sharing mechanism. Um, in CBRS, is basically uh, a portion of it is generally available, and this portion is actually private, private use. However, that private use is actually a private access license. Um, it's still allowed to be used by any other entity if it's not used by the licensee. So th this is a way to really optimize spectrum. If, if someone have a spectrum and it's not used, somebody else can take advantage of it until 
the, the license holder actually starts using it. So that's one way and we can, that this same method can be used in introducing 5G initially and through a database driven method. That's one way. Uh, the other way is, maybe another way is through, uh, you know, sharing uh, the same spectrum between a number of um, different, for instance, you know, similar to how we have it with LA, which is basically the way to use the Wi-Fi spectrum between uh, Wi-Fi and LTE. And it's basically contention-based uh, method where uh, before anyone uh, uses, before any uh, network uses this spectrum, it actually listens first. When there is no user, it actually would broadcast or would, would send data. And if, if there is a collision, if there is a contention, it actually would back, uh, back up and, and, and then try again when, there is, when it listens and, and there is no user for the spectrum. So LA is one innovation that's already in place, can be used for, for instance, CBRS. The two different ideas, innovations, but actually what's really happening is the, what we call dynamic spectrum sharing. So dynamic spectrum sharing is, a, is a, an approach that actually Ericsson uh, uh, pioneered. And, and the idea is that uh, you have many 4G networks today already using, for instance, the 4G spectrum. Why not introduce 5G very slowly in the same spectrum using the exact same hardware for that matter? That would be an optimal approach to actually introducing, uh, to introducing 5G. So a hardware uh, that can support 4G and 5G radios, so the, the radios can actually uh, do transmission with the, the new radio waveform as well as the LTE waveforms and using the same spectrum. Uh, what that means is that um, as you, if, if there's only very few 5G devices, in a, in a spectrum, in a 20 megahertz, for instance, that spectrum is fully available for 4G. So there is no loss of spectrum whatsoever in that case. Um, so the way, you know, at a, a very, uh, you know, basic level, the way this is done is by preserving, the, basically, in the, the uh, physical resources, it's called the PRBs that are used to send data in LTE or in uh, 5G, we preserve the minimum requirements for both technologies. There is a reference signal that is being sent, for instance, in the 4G systems uh, every so much time. So those resource blocks that need to send that reference signal are preserved and never used by 5G. 5G also has requirements into certain resource blocks that sometimes being used when you have a UE-specific reference signal. Uh, or there is a sync, uh, primary sync or secondary sync that keeps the, uh, the device is connected as well. So those kind of basically specific number of resources are preserved either for 4G and 5G. All the other resources can be shared based on need. And because the resources can be shared based on need, both 4G devices and, can, and 5G devices can use the same spectrum at the same time. And a, uh, a good scheduler implementation would just be able to prioritize between 4G and 5G, and that would be configurable to some extent into who takes priority, for instance, and whether you want to provide, like there is a maximum maybe for one versus the other. All of that can be configurable. Uh, but that would give a really uh, good approach and a good way to introduce 5G into an existing spectrum using even existing hardware. Um, from an Ericsson perspective, just don't know about uh, all OEMs, actually, all the radios that Ericsson have shipped in the past five years are capable of actually <coughs> using both 4G and 5G. And we'd be able to split the spectrum and be able to uh, support the same, uh, you know, with the same hardware, both technologies. So um, it, it, from that perspective, now what we're saying is you would probably start with the baseline if today's baseline is a 4G network. So usually it's deployed in the low band, as we just said, that's needed for complete coverage. And in some cases we have the mid bands, either the you know, AWS or uh, you know, the, the uh, 2.5 gigahertz, for instance, or the CBRS, which is in the 3.5. All those mid bands and the low band would initially have 4G. Then we introduce that dynamic spectrum sharing. That dynamic spectrum sharing is really, for instance, we, if we start in the low bands, that's an existing radio, an existing, existing spectrum, and we can share 4G and 5G in it. <coughs> Millimeter wave 
is really a 5G spectrum. So that would be more hotspot-like, introduces 5G with extremely high capacity where needed only. And, and this actually, if you look around in the, uh, you know, for instance, uh, the tier ones, you'll find a lot of them using that, exactly that approach where millimeter wave is, that, that's initially where they have started. And now they are actually introducing DSS or that the dynamic spectrum sharing in low bands. One of the benefits of this is that low band provides coverage. Now 5G coverage, when it gets enabled, it's going to be almost nationwide because all the, uh, all the low band now can support 4G and 5G. Obviously, on the, on the other hand, obviously that's 5G coverage, but doesn't provide the full benefit from a throughput perspective of 5G because this really happens only with the high bands. However, it, it still benefits around latency, reduced latency, for instance, that can still be supported if we have a dynamic spectrum sharing in the uh, low bands. And over time, we can add that dynamic sh spectrum sharing also in the mid bands. And you can now have a network with both 4G and 5G that is doing optimal support really of uh, you know, spectrum and resources. Um, down the road, now, uh, the, the question would be, okay, so we have networks with uh, a lot of different requirements, whether it's, you know, has cellular IoT, it can have connected vehicles, uh, and so on. And uh, the goal is really to start introducing artificial intelligence and machine language in predicting um, how much resources are needed for each type of use case and application, and, and start actually using that artificial intelligence in actually deciding the amount of resources, where the actually uh, devices are gonna go, whether it's a high band or low band, and start making decisions and predictions uh, based on models that would be built over time. Um, and and uh, so, so that would actually optimize truly uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, you know, benefits that you can get out of your hardware, your resources for whether it's a spectrum, uh, and everything else. So longer term, obviously, machine language can play a huge uh, role in, in, in such a network and to optimize <coughs> all resources. Uh, that's all I had to, uh, to, to go through, and we'll probably give it back to uh, Will. All right. all right, thank you. Well, we covered uh, a lot of great topics uh, ranging from uh, network core to devices, the spectrum. I think I'm going to open it up for Q&A uh, now. And uh, if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand, call on you for any of the three speakers. Nobody? So just to uh, reiterate the question, so everybody can hear, I think this is for yeah. Lloyd, right, uh, on dual SIM. Yeah. Uh, so this is about how are we comparing and contrasting in those uh, those bubble charts uh, okay. yeah. so of, of in the service uh, effectiveness. Oh, so in uh, the uh, chart that I show, the result for the test, uh, there was no uh, link aggregation uh, in there. So the comparison was between uh, if you were on a single network, like uh, on the MNO network, without mobility, or if you were on the um, MSO network, without mobility. So what is the behavior of that service? And with uh, low mobility, that means low speed uh, mobility and high speed mobility. Um, of course, uh, all the results were uh, above uh, satisfactory, above good. Uh, and we did not yet uh, implement the uh, link aggregation. We are right now implementing <coughs> the link aggregation and w uh, after we implemented the link aggregation, you can see that uh, there, uh, the, the interruption was minimized to nothing. You can't see the interruption with link aggregation working between uh, um, moving between two networks. So um, with that, uh, that's the 
result. But the uh, use case that I display, we didn't have link aggregation active at that time or geofencing. Okay, great. Yeah. So, with you mean uh, with and without link aggregation? Right, and I'm saying specifically, I thought you said that link aggregation would be an application level specific um, solution. So, if you were using, say, an iPhone that and you were using the Safari browser that did not implement that, I was just wondering how that affected the user's perception of the functionality, or are you actually expecting? Every single built-in application on these devices would have to be enhanced to take advantage of link aggregation. So, um, with the link aggregation, right, currently we're uh, using or we're testing with uh, an app, over-the-top app, so that we'll have uh, more control uh, over the functionality. Uh, but for all the uh, user apps, including web browsers and streaming, um, they will not have any visibility of the IP address, of the interface IP address. Let's assume you take in, in Wi-Fi, you got a private IP address. Uh, the app is using Wi-Fi. It will not see that IP address. It will go into that virtual tunnel that is established between the handset and the server and it will use the virtual IP address. Um, there is capability to exclude uh, apps from there, but uh, when you're using uh, the link aggregation, uh, all the apps for the subscriber, the user apps, will go through that uh, tunnel. Uh, now, we didn't see for uh, web browsing any effect on uh, session transitioning with regard to web browsing. Uh, does that uh, answer the question? Yeah, we'll make a follow-up with you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What tunneling protocol are you using for that? It's a, uh, uh, right now it's using uh, IPsec for tunneling in that app, yeah. Uh, we we are looking into others. Uh, we didn't like uh, uh, select an app for uh, commercialization yet. This is uh, in our testing. Sure. Yeah. Uh, most of the uh, link aggregation apps they have capability of uh, enable encryption and disable encryption. So. Uh, we can do uh, with encryption and without encryption. Okay, great questions. Uh, anybody else have any other questions for any of the presenters? I think I, I had uh, one for Drew, just kind of going back to the spectrum. Um, how are you guys looking at evaluating the spectrum needs amongst the various options that are out there, you know, uh, licensed, unlicensed, lightly licensed, et cetera, and given, um, you know, given the current climate and the upcoming options and so forth. Yeah, great question. Um, the, I, I would say primarily cost, right? So licensed has somewhat been kind of at a, not really on the table. That's kind of changing with CBRS because one, there's anticipation of the cost per Hertz is going to be a lot lower than licensed. Um, I, I think what we're struggling to do is, is put a value on that license when you have the kind of GAA option. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. a lot of the, the kind of testing, and, and it's funny as when you get into testing, we may be relying on the SASs to tell us, you know, really what is the difference in GAA availability versus PAL availability. 
but we have to make these decisions before the auction. So right, that, right. that's that's the challenge of, of you know, we had some test methodologies developed and when we worked with the SASs we actually figured out that's be pretty poor compared to the information they could just give us. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of the path we're headed down is work closely with the SASs to kind of solve that specifically for CBRS. And then I'd say we, we lean towards, you know, use an EBAN or the, you know, where you register, I call it lightly licensed, but it's, um, you know, that would probably be our preferred method for like point to point or point to multi-point. Okay. Yeah, good stuff. Presumably if C-band became in that, in that same realm, you guys would be interested think, in that as well. Yeah. I think there's some assumption as things come available, they're going to maintain this tiered kind of licensing structure. So. Right. Um, so, a uh, quick question um, for Henny. Um, DSS kind of breaks my brain, so I'm not going to pretend I, I fully comprehend all the mechanics of how DSS works and the 4G, 5G splitting, but kind of curious, um, you know, with, with a lot of us MSOs kind of basically having the opportunity to greenfield um, <clears throat> this, uh, you know, deployment of wireless technology at this point, you know, some, some I'm sure are looking to go directly to 5G and leapfrog from LTE. Um, what, you know, as a, from your perspective, what spectrum should they be looking at with respect to a strategy like that? Or do you recommend against that or, you know, based on kind of your, your perspective with DSS and the capabilities? Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, well, CBRS is a great place to start. And actually, this is an area where you also can take uh, you know, advantage of uh, that DSS that we were talking about, because initially, the, you know, CBRS can be a 4G spectrum, and it will be upgraded to 5G and can also take advantage of uh, DSS. I think I when you're thinking about Greenfield, you're going to have to look into all possible spectrum, and, and the cost is extremely mm -hmm. important, as Drew was saying. So uh, millimeter wave is available. It's more of hotspot. Um, a C band is would be a great option. To obviously, 24 is just was just around the corner here. Uh, there is even some 2.5 gigahertz. Uh, there is uh, the white space in it uh, is going to be offered at some point in the short term. So uh, obviously, uh, you know there is spectrum that's available, and e e you don't necessarily you can go to 5G directly. Uh, the question is going to continue to be about devices. Do you need to support both or just go 100% to 5G? Right. right. Yeah. The ecosystem is always going to be <coughs> a little bit lagging, yeah, especially exactly. with the standalone support. So any, uh, any other questions from the field? All right. Um, I just had, I think, one more for Drew, I think. Uh, I'm just curious from your perspective. You talked a little bit about private LTE. Um, now, how do you see private LTE in the MSO space coming to life? Is that uh, you know a new service offering that we that we're all offering as part of the SMB enterprise packages, or do you think there's I mean there's already a cottage industry kind of sprouting up around yeah. it? But um, just kind of curious how you think that's gonna how, that's gonna move forward. It, it, you're, you talked about the enablement side of it, which I think is very smart the way you guys are approaching it, um, but just. Kind of curious what your thoughts are there. Yeah, private LTE has it's been funny because everyone supports it, but when you ask them what would you trial, it's really whatever you want. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah, but what? <laughs> and same working with our, our product and, and strategy people is, is I think we define a set, you know, of specific, you know, ar around a vertical like hospitality where you, you collect a set of whether it's, you know, for the maids to have security badges, you know, that are, they're tracked and they have a panic button, um, asset tracking, and but a set of specific things that you would offer as a package to a vertical. Um, it could also be a standard, just enterprise business type package. But, you know, the private LTE is, is very broad in what you can do. Um, you know, really any kind of IOT service can go over it. Plus you can, you can add, you know, private voice systems um, a lot of people think private LTE they confuse it with the um, you know the the MNO kind of offload which is neutral host and it's it's really different it's really much more targeted IOT solutions 
But I think you have to package it to be successful. And to your point, I think that's why it's so fragmented and there's a lot of people growing because they're really coalescing around individual applications and solutions that use LTE. So we're going to have to define a kind of standard set of things to offer to have a common offering among, you know, MSOs that we would all get behind, I think. So. Yeah, I, I, th I think you're right. The CBRS band has earned its name as the innovation band for sure. Um, you know, there's, a, there's so much stuff going on there. It seems like you kind of have to boil the ocean for the customer a little yeah. bit. So, all right. Um, with that, I think we'll wrap up. Um, thank you guys. Round of applause from everybody. <laughs> great, great content. I encourage everybody to take a look at uh, the papers. They're great. Um, and get online and download them and read through them. Thanks a bunch. <laughs>